Welcome, everybody. It's an absolute delight to have you all here. I think we are currently just tipping over about 300 people um, attending at the moment, and we're, the um, numbers are still increasing. So it's a great pleasure on behalf of the association to introduce uh, Professor Rachel Wood, uh, Professor of Carbonate Geoscience at the University of Edinburgh, to give the annual address at Palace 2020. So Rachel has wide-ranging research interests and has made important contributions to topics as diverse as carbonate diagenesis, modeling of carbonate systems, the role of changing seawater and carbonate production, and the rise of biomineralization and reef evolution. And finally, and the topic of today's talk, Rachel is a leading authority on the biology and geology of the events that occurred at the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. So Rachel's research contributions to date have been recognized by numerous scientific societies, and this is a good chance to actually congratulate her on the most recent, the award of the Lyle Medal of the Geological Society of London earlier. Uh, visually, at least, it's dominated by an extraordinary variety of uh, macro explosion. Oops. And the, uh, what I really want to, to explore today are some tales from the Cambrian explosion. So. This is how you would uh, you would see the sea floor if you were, you were snorkeling over it um, about 3.6 to about five a billion years ago to about 575 million years ago, a dominantly microbial world of stromatolites and thrombolites, and then appearing pretty globally, um, we have this ediacaran biota of macroscopic life. So uh, large, soft-bodied biota, uh, the first trace fossils as ev evidence of mobility. And then towards the Precambrian Cambrian, within, within about 10 or 12 million years of the Precambrian Cambrian boundary, the first skeletal macrobiota. These are dominantly, a lot of these forms are still problematic, but as we get close to the Precambrian Cambrian boundary, we can start to become much more confident that we, we really are dealing with animals. Uh, and then, of course, from the, uh, from the Precambrian uh, Cambrian boundary onwards, we have the the, the tremendous explosion of metazoans in the fossil record, uh, incredible diversity of life, including lots of the, the phyla that we have today. So where are the roots of this Cambrian explosion? So these are a, a few images of some iconic uh, fossils that we think of as being at least indicative of complex life. Uh, many of these forms are almost certainly not metazoans, but as we uh, Go beyond the Gaskers radiation, this uh, this uh, regional, uh, sorry, the Gaskers snowball, uh, this this regional snowball event, we start to get these these taxa, particularly of the Ediacaran biota, uh, which may represent some of the first animals. And as I say, as we get closer towards the uh, towards the terminal Ediacaran, we can become confident that these are uh, some of our oldest true animal fossils. Traditionally, we've thought of the Ediacaran biota as being very separate from the Cambrian biota, and indeed separated as well by a mass extinction. However, two new lines of evidence have suggested this uh, story is really uh, far from clear. One is we have new ash bed dates from Namibia, and these suggest that these terminal uh, Ediacaran uh, rocks are not 541 million years old as previously thought, but at least two million years younger. So we have ash beds at 539 million years old now. So in other words, this extends the Ediacaran biota in, in creeping into effectively uh, rocks that were thought to be Cambrian age. And secondly, uh, we've had the findings of taxa, skeletal taxa, particularly uh, some aliburitids, which are classically thought of as being Cambrian skeletal taxa, and they are now found in Ediacaran rocks. In other words, we now have this evidence of a transition between the, the, the Ediacaran biota and the Cambrian biota, which really does bring uh, to question whether we have any mass extinction at all. The other line of evidence, of course, is that we have uh, the, the it's only a few genera that really stagger on of the Ediacaran soft-bodied biota into the latest Ediacaran rocks. So we really need to think about this event as being a transitional event. In other words, the Ediacaran, Ediacaran Cambrian transition. And indeed, if we think about some of these uh, characteristics that we associate with complex life, I just listed a few uh, here, we can see that it really does build up during the Ediacaran, really 
towards the terminal ediacaral reticula. So, of course, we can debate exactly when these uh, innovations happened, but nonetheless, I think everyone would agree many of them are occurring in the Ediacaran rather than the Cambrian. So we need to take these biotas, in, in, in my view, as a holistic whole and by treating it in a holistic way and also integrating soft bodied with the skeletal with the trace fossil record, we can really start to interrogate some of the drivers for the Cambrian explosion. So this is what I want to consider, this uh, relationship between environmental change and how that produces opportunities and permissive environments in which evolutionary innovation can take place. Now, of course, this isn't a one way dialogue. There's often feedbacks between evolutionary innovation feeding back on the environment. So this, uh, this sort of narrative, this linear narrative here of the evolution of life through time it, we know that it's far more complex than that. We have mass extinctions, we have feedbacks. It's a very, very dynamic uh, interaction on multiple timescales. Of course, we know that the record that we have, these are really only, the fossils only record the minimum, uh, the, the minimum age of, uh, of these um, groups. We know that they must have deeper roots. So they must have appeared uh, at much a deeper time. Of course, there's huge uncertainty as shown by the blue vertical lines here on when these taxa really appeared. And of course, the most uncertain of all is when the metazoa appeared. It, according to molecular clocks, it could be anywhere in the Toyonian right through to uh, quite a, a lot of the Cryogenian too, although not everyone, of course, follows this. Uh, there, there, there's not yet a consensus. Uh, the reason for this may be that these uh, animals were simply not capable of fossilization. Uh, but there's another strand to this, which is the potential role of oxygen. So it's been suggested for, for really uh, well over half a century that, that, that changing oxygen levels have some uh, dynamic role to play in the history of the metazoa. Maybe not so much in the origin of the metazoa as the, this original idea of Nursal, but certainly in its later manifestation in the fossil record. And this is what I particularly want to um, hone in on. So I'm going to sit, set up a series of hypotheses, and this is the first one, that oxygen did control the Ediacar and Cambrian rise of metazoans. So when we think about the oxygen demands of these extinct biota, of course, we really have no idea what the oxygen demands of some of these forms might have been. Uh, the cat was put amongst the pigeons recently when it was proposed that uh, some of the baseline vertebrates, particular sponges, have much, much lower oxygen demands than uh, forms that, that follow uh, high energy uh, or metabolically demanding um, carnivorous lifestyles. So this is the modern bread, uh, breadcrumb sponge. You can see that it was found that it could exist at really extraordinarily low percentages of present atmospheric, uh, uh, atmospheric levels of oxygen. So this raised the possibility that actually uh, our oldest animal fossils, in fact, were not adapted to fully oxic conditions and may, in fact, have been adapted to uh, very low oxygen conditions. If we then look at the state of play of uh, the history of oxygenation on the Earth uh, uh, until about five years ago or so. So this just shows you a cartoon of these same uh, iconic uh, biota. Uh, B shows you this, uh, the history of the carbon isotope record. But in A, we can see a cartoon of the distribution of oxygen uh, in seawater. And you can see for the majority of the cryogenian and half of the Ediacaran, at mid depths of deep oceans, we had anox anoxic waters. They were ferruginous. They, were they had a reasonable amount of free iron. And at mid depths, but only intermittently, we had what's known as euxinic conditions, uh, sulfidic with free uh, sulfur. And the oxygenation was really only a very superficial veneer on the, uh, on the top of this, uh, on the sea uh, water column. And then it was supposed that we had an oxygenation event uh, at some point in the Ediacaran that started to progressively oxygenate both uh, uh, um, greater amounts of surface waters, but also the mid and deeper oceanic waters. Now, is this really true? So let's consider now this critical 10 million years of the Ediacaran just before the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. So this is what Earth looked like then. We had a series of microcontinents which uh, straddled the equator, mostly in the southern hemisphere. 
And I want to, want to concentrate on the record here from the Kalahari Cradle. This is modern day Namibia, where we've been going for, for many years now. And this has a really remarkable record. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a desert area. We have extraordinarily continuous outcrops where we can trace uh, beds over hundreds of kilometers. There's no issue with correlation at all. Uh, multiple ash beds and also a, a very, very rich biota, not only of soft bodied uh, Ediacaran forms, but these oldest skeletal forms and trace fossils as well. So we've been concentrating on trying to create a 4D model of changing redox through time. In other words, where were the anoxic water bodies? Where was the oxic water bodies? And uh, as I mentioned, we have a very, very good uh, record of, of ash bed dates. I've just highlighted the, the lowermost and the topmost here. And we also have, just shown in these, these purple stars, we have this uh, very rich record throughout the succession of the Nama group um, of, for example, Claudina, one of these earlier skeletal biomineralizers. The obvious, the other very uh, uh, serendipitous um, aspect of the Nama basin is that we actually have two sub-basins, this northern basin here, the Zaris, and the, and the southern sub-basin. So we've been concentrating on taking a shelf to basin transect. So these are basinal successions going up through pinnacle reefs right up to this very, very shallow part of the Osis Arch, which would have been a very, very shallow lagoon or inner ramp area, and then back down towards the south through another transect. So in other words, we've got these localities shown here uh, that we are where we are, we have chosen them to progressively sample different water depths. And we can compare the behavior of these two basins. So we can really ask the question is the redox in these basins controlled by something that is global or is it controlled by something that is local? In other words, they have independent histories. So in this way, we can build up this 4D shelf to basin transect of redox. So we've been uh, sampling pretty intensely, more or less every meter or so. And by the way, there is a uh, heavy metal, death metal, I think, Norwegian group called Anoxia. So what we're doing really here is tracing Anoxia through time. And uh, having we, we can then interrogate these samples using various types of uh, redox proxies. Now, there's an, a massive uh, cottage industry out there of different redox proxy, proxies. They all measure slightly different things, and they all are uh, they are a huge range between global, regional, and local proxies. So we favor the use of local proxies because in that way we can really tie the uh, occurrence of biota with an exact, as, as exact a redox state as we can. So our two proxies of choice, these two local proxies, one is iron speciation, and it's a very uh, straightforward proxy that simply looks at the proportion of total iron to what we call these highly reactive ions that I've listed here. And if this proportion is less than 0.22, so it's highly reactive iron over total iron, we can infer that the sediment was deposited in an oxic environment and above 0.38 in an anoxic environment. And secondly, we can use the ratio of pyrite to high reactive iron to distinguish between whether the water had was ferruginous with iron or whether it had free sulfur, that it was euxinic. Now, uh, iron speciation only really tells us if there was a, a quantity of free oxygen. It doesn't tell us about the amount of oxygen. They can't di differentiate between highly oxygenated and uh, scarcely oxygenated environments. It just picks up oxic, uh, oxic signature. So we really needed to, to test this hypothesis of uh, the, uh, whether these earliest uh, metazoans were adapted to low oxygen conditions. We needed an additional proxy. So for this, we used cerium, the cerium anomaly. Now, cerium, this rare earth cerium, these, this paired three to four cerium, is very, very closely tied to this redox uh, transition from, from manganese four to manganese three. And the, the critical thing here is this happens at a much higher redox potential than the couplet of ferric to ferrous iron. In other words, because it's happening at a higher redox potential, it's potentially picking out low oxygen manganese waters. So to co by combining the iron speciation with the serum anomaly, we can, we can distinguish between anoxic ferruginous or euxinic, manganese, which is low oxygen, and then well oxygenated waters. So here is now the, the sort of compiled data set of the entire Nama Basin. So this is the basin 
The base of, of the Nama Basin, about um, Nama group, about 550 million years ago, right up to approximately 538 million years ago. The banding here, the color banding is just showing you blue for oxic, black for anoxic, which is all ferruginous, and then purple for these intermediate low oxygen manganous waters. And the cartoon here shows you what's been happening through time. And the, the first obvious thing is this redoxic line, so the, the, the boundary between the oxic, the low oxygen, and the ox anoxic uh, waters is incredibly dynamic. It's high at the beginning of the, the record, and then it, it crashes down, it shoals up again, and so on. So first of all, it's extremely dynamic. But secondly, here we've plotted in cartoon form the position of all the biota we find, and they are all exclusively found in these oxy oxic waters. There are none that are found in low oxygen waters at all. In other words, we can say on, on the basis of this, that these Ediacaran fossils, be they skeletal, soft-bodied, or the oldest trace fossils, or some of the oldest trace fossils, are were really restricted to these local oxic oases by the presence of these anoxic and low oxygen waters. They were, they were clinging on to relatively small areas, but those, those areas were expanding and contracting in a really quite dynamic way. The other thing we can see is the two basins have a very independent history. And you can see that most clearly at the base of this record here. You can see these, these colors do not uh, correlate with each other. In other words, we have to evoke local drivers for the, the distribution of redox in these two basins. So looking at a, a, a bird's eye view now of these two basins. So again, this shows a very nice uh, graphic of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, ebbing and flowing and the shoaling of these anoxic waters. And we can see that at about 545 million years ago, we started to see the progressive stabilization of oxygen. This is the point when the chemocline, uh, the redoxycline finally uh, uh, um, became deeper and disappeared and we ended up with a fully, a fully oxygenated basin by the time we got uh, close to the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary. So the record here, at least of the Nama Basin, shows this progressive stabilization of oxygenation, where it becomes pretty stable close to the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary. Now, if we consider the, uh, the drivers for this, so this is an indication of alteration, the chemical index of alteration, and it's really just a proxy for degree of weathering. And you can see here that successively through time, we see this decline of weathering close to the Cambrian boundary. So we are fairly sure, and we have other data to support this, that at the beginning of this record, very high rates of weathering were effectively creating a very high nutrient load, which is in turn uh, creating an oxygen de deficiency, created widespread anoxia in the basins. But as uh, weathering um, uh, uh, ceased, or, or, or at least uh, became more subdued, we saw the progressive stabilization of this oxygenation. And we, we ended up with uh, lower nutrient waters that were, were far better oxygenated because there was no oxygen deficiency. So the critical question here is how did the animals respond? So first of all, here's a proxy for uh, biotubation, both in terms of the percentage of the bedding plane biotubated and also the biotubation intensity. And you can see that it really does start to ramp up, particularly within a few million years of the boundary. And secondly, looking at the distribution of soft-bodied and skeletal biotas, this shows you where they're sitting from the shore face out to the basinal areas. And you can see that forms start to follow uh, uh, this chemocline, as the chemocline uh, becomes deeper and the oxic habitats expand, the biota is simply following it. So we see this real expansion of available oxic habitats, fully oxygenated habitats towards the boundary and life Macroscopic life is simply following it. So I think we are some way to proving this first hypothesis that oxygen did control this rise of metazoans in the terminal Ediacaran to Cambrian, and it was driven in large part by habitat expansion. Uh, however, we know that these habitats were very, very uh, dynamic and much smaller than habitats today. And of course, I've just been talking about one craton here, the Kalahari craton, uh, many similar studies haven't really taken place in many of these other cratons, and it will be very 
are likely that in fact we have a different redox story in other areas. For example, South China, every indication there is that the, the, the redox dynamics and the nutrient load really were quite different. So we have to imagine if these, uh, these redox, um, these local basins, the redox records are being driv driven by diff different styles of weathering, we do start to have to think about a co-evolution of oxygen and life with te plate tectonics. Because ultimately, uh, the, the rates of rifting are determining uh, and, the, and the rates of um, continental breakup are determining some of these uh, weathering rates. So this is very much an area of future research. So I've shown this, this image before. It's not really the case. This was the case until about five million years ago. But in fact, the story is now far more complex. We almost certainly have, rather than just a, a single linear, uh, a single um, crescendo of oxygenation, we have these many, many episodic oxygenation events. And some of them have been given names here. And intervening between these oxic events, these are oceanic oxic events, we have events where the uh, the redox decline really shoaled up onto into the shallow marine areas. In other words, these are anoxic events. And some of them have been known for a long time and have been given names. So for example, the Potlin here and the Sinsk. Now what's interesting is a lot of these oceanic oxic events correspond to tremendous perturbations in the carbon isotope cycle, mostly uh, negative excursions, although there's great debate as to really what the relationship is and what the drivers are and the, the process behind what is uh, currently uh, mostly an empirical uh, relationship. So this is also an area of, of, of great interest. But I want to concentrate on one record now, the, the, the record of the Lower Cambrian, which passes from the, from the, the base, uh, the pre-Cambrian Cambrian boundary, up here to this first mass extinction event of the Phanerozoic, the Sinsk. So this is the second hypothesis, that dynamic redox, rather than being a, um, a, a, a something that was very bad and, and caused uh, repeated mass extinctions as it does later in the Phanerozoic, itself was actually a dynamic driver of innovation. And it controlled the tempo of the Edicar and Cambrian explosion. So, Body size is something that has become uh, back to the fore um, in, in paleobiological thinking. And we know that many taxa show a tremendous variability of body size. And it was this American paleontologist, Edward Drinker Pope, who uh, coined the idea that uh, lineages will show a progressive increase of body size through time. And this is really based on this simple idea that big fish, fish eat little fish. In other words, if you're big, you're going to be better at virtually everything. You're a better competitor for resources, a better predator. You will have a higher reproductive fitness. So being big, big is a very, very good indication of, uh, has, has a lot of selective power. And this idea of Cope's law was uh, reinvigorated about 15 years ago by the Stanford group. And they uh, constructed this extraordinary compilation of changes of body size of these major taxa through time, the whole, through the whole of the Phanerozoic. And you can see that there is a very clear trend of a biovolume increase, this is a logarithmic scale, through Phanerozoic. And this is shown in all those groups that were interrogated. However, we know that body size can change on much shorter time scales. So for example, we have the well understood Lilliput effect. So this is related to, often to um, stress, so shown here in, uh, in forams, uh, when um, spe species or, or members of a clade simply show a remarkable shrinking of, of size. And this has been uh, correlated with many of our major mass extinctions. This is a, a very uh, interesting study by Kimberly Lau of the N. Permian extinction. And she used uranium isotopes here as a proxy for widespread anoxia. And you can see here in B, this big negative kick in the uranium isotopes, I've shaded it in gray. This shows a, a, show, a, a huge global expansion of anoxia at that uh, this bit of geological time. And you can see that gastropods responded by really becoming very, very tiny. Again, this is a logarithmic scale. It took them quite some time, millions of years, to, uh, to um, gain their uh, no normal size again. And indeed, 
this is now quite a, a well-developed motif of changing body size with oxygen, either increase of oxygen or decrease of oxygen. And the Stanford group, again, it looked at, again, a very long time scale, in this case, through uh, most of life. And they correlated the size of cells and the, size, the bio volumes of biota through time with these changes of atmospheric oxygen. Now, our, our idea of the changes of atmospheric oxygen here have now changed, but nonetheless, it is evoked that uh, as more and more oxygen becomes available in the atmosphere, life has responded simply by getting the beginning. However, these are very long-term uh, studies, and uh, Andre Zhravlov and I wanted to really interrogate the change of body size through uh, uh, using a very, very high resolution study to understand this through the early, early Cambrian. And we looked in this case at Siberia. So the Siberian platform was a separate uh, continent. It's been extremely well studied by Soviet uh, geologists and, and uh, right, Russian geologists and, and others through the present day. Very, very rich and well understood biota. And uh, where, where correlations are now relatively well established. And we consider these uh, classic Cambrian groups, archaeocyte sponges, halcyon and mollusks, Hyaliths and brachiopods. Um, so we collected data from the, uh, the literature and also from our own observations, and we simply recorded for every uh, subset of time, we put this, these bins, uh, uh, two and a half million year bins, and we recorded the largest representative recorded for that time bin. And these are the data that we gained. So this is a, a, just a, a linear dimension, the, the maximum linear dimension of these groups. And you can see these, these body size changes are remarkably dynamic over very, very short periods of time. So I've, this, I've used the Siberian scale here, but we sort of see this tremendous increase in the, towards the end of the Tomotian, and then a decrease in the Atabanian. And then here we have the mass extinction event, the Sinsk event, where we see a, a, a loss, not only a loss of biota, but also falls becoming much, much smaller, and then an extraordinary rebound and an increase in size thereafter. Now, if we interrogate, interrogate this more closely for the individual group, so first of all, uh, the archaeocyaths, uh, I've just given you the number of species here. You can see, again, an increase in the uh, end of the Timotian, a remarkable decrease, increase, and then we have an, uh, an extinction of the group, uh, uh, almost complete extinction by the Sinsk event. And what's remarkable is the Helsinian and mollusks and the Hylus show absolutely synchronous changes. I've just uh, shown in blue here where the maximum body sizes are. So you can see that all these groups, and of course they're quite independent, show this synchronous increase in body size, decrease, increase, and then, and then decrease again after the Sinsk. However, we also looked at brachiopods, and they show a totally different pattern. Uh, absolutely orthogonal, very large sizes at the beginning of their record, a decrease through most of the earlier Cambrian, and then they actually get bigger after the Sinsk event. So this is quite remarkable. We have groups that are showing synchroneity, and then groups that are showing something very, very different. We also notice that individual species themselves could change size. And we plotted here just those species that showed a size change, about 20 species of Archaeocyas and a handful of others. And again, remarkably, these show these tremendous changes in size, sometimes uh, up to about um, times three changes in size, again, following these size, uh, the, the overall size changes uh, found in the, uh, the, the groups as a whole. So this tells us that these biota are incredibly flexible. They can adapt to something in the environment that is enabling them to increase in size and then decrease in size in an extraordinarily adaptive, flexible fashion. But what's remarkable, again, is that we have this quite disjunct record. We have these three groups that are showing something, a, 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 whatever they're responding to, they're responding to synchronously. Uh, and we can infer then that it's something in the environment that they are responding to synchronously. But the brachiopods are doing something very, very different. The, the suggestion then is that we, to, to really unravel these dynamics of the Cambrian explosion, we have to understand the physiological response to whatever is happening in the environment. 
Uh, and also, what's remarkable is that the, these groups are responding very, very differently to this mass extinction. Some groups are being hit by it, these first three groups in particular, but the brachiopods almost uh, benefit from this mass extinction by increasing in size and, in fact, flourishing thereafter. And it's no surprise that these archaeosaths, they go extinct at the Sinsk. Healthy Leonids don't last for very, very much longer. One higher species, I think, staggers on to the Permian, but brachiopods, as we know, become very dominant members of the Paleozoic biota. So that's just one metric, body size. What if we start to interrogate some other metrics? So here I've added in, in red, diversity. And you can see for these first three groups again, we have a synchronous, except for this uh, slight mismatch in the Halcyon Leonids in the early part of the record, generally body size changes in concert with diversity. However, the brachiopods, not at all. Uh, the increase in diversity really takes off and uh, we don't see a, we see some uh, response in body size, but not a, a, a massive response in body size. So there's, there's and there's certainly no uh, um, correlation in the early part of the bracket record. Now let's add rates of origination. So here the archaeosciaths do exactly what you'd expect. The two origination events absolutely correspond to where we have large numbers of species, uh, uh, um, uh, a number of large species. In other words, these two origination events, what they're doing is they are increasing preferentially the numbers of large species. However, if we now consider extinction, and again, extinction following hot on the heels of the origination, the extinction is also is preferentially removing these large species, species uh, to then therefore just retain the small species in the record. However, Let's contrast this with the Hylis story. So here is the, uh, in yellow, the, the rates of origination. But here, origination only increases the number of large species in this latter part of the record, after the mid atabanian And it really takes off after the Sinsk event. In other words, origination is playing a very, very different role here in controlling both, uh, in controlling uh, body size changes. And if indeed we add extinction, this tells us something further. Extinction only drives the increase in uh, size in the, in the late Timotian here because it's preferentially removing small species at this point. And that's why we see an increase of larger species. However, it does absolutely the opposite with the Sinsk event because it's preferentially removing the large species. So in other words, choosing our metrics as determinants of change these metrics themselves are telling us very, very different things, and they may indeed be telling us the differential response to drivers and that all the drivers are not the same. So to my mind, the only way we can really start to unpick the dynamics of the Cambrian explosion is by really interrogating these different metrics and trying to get under their skin of what they really mean in terms of metabolic and particularly physiological response. So putting this together again, here's the, the same body size data here in, in, in just a log um, plot. What does it mean? What is it responding to? Well, there is an enormous amount of data uh, on the redox dynamics, the lower Cambrian. Uh, however, and we have both local and global indicators. So I've just indicated here in red, these are indicators where we have uh, global anoxia. However, the problem with uh, these, uh, most of these data are from uranium isotopes, but the problem with this data, it, these data, is that of course all it can tell us is how much of the sea floor may have become anoxic, and that's done via making assumptions with models. However, the shallow, the really extreme shallow, the shallow marine environment may be largely unaffected. Uh, so even though we may, sh the uranium isotopes may indicate global anoxia, the environment in which most of these biota were living, and remember they're still at this stage probably limited to oxic oases, are maybe untouched by these uh, encroaching uh, waters that, that they're living in these oases. However, looking at a local proxy that was taken exactly from the same localities where we've derived our data, uh, so on the Siberian platform, look at these, uh, ex this extraordinary record of carbon isotopes. So these are really uh, high, very, very um, high resolution, short-term, 
oscillations in the carbon isotope record. And you can see that here um, I've just labeled um, seven of them. And what's remarkable if each one of these is actually uh, you, you can when you interrogate the sulfur isotopes, they are absolutely mirroring the carbon isotopes. And this tell us this, this, this very, very close coupling is telling us about the redox dynamics. And these uh, these the, the Lees group who did this work modeled this and they show that each one of these uh, positive excursions is a pulse of oxygen in a, an otherwise generally anoxic environment. And the the rising limb here, or the limb becoming more negative, is then a depletion of oxygen. So each one of these is probably a, a very short-lived transient pulse of oxygenation on the Siberian platform. And this particular point, point uh, four, this point also corresponds to a major expansion of reefs on the Siberian platform. So this point seems to indicate a, a a very significant pulse of oxygenation and perhaps these body size changes are responding to this although this is this is not of course uh, yet uh, totally um, totally clear but it's, it is a possibility that in in effect these groups are responding to some sort of uh, oxic and probably productivity pulses as well in the shallow mean environment and they are responding by these very very dynamic changes in body size and changing rates of origination uh, needless to say, everything was really knocked out by the Sinsk event here. We lose this coupling of the carbon and, and sulfur isotopes uh, because we are entering really a very dominant anoxic world at that stage. So I think we've shown that the dynamic redox really did control the, the tempo of this Ediacar and Cambrian explosion. But it's not as simple as that. Physiology is very, very different, a very, very important physiological differences may actually be giving us the nature of our record, the, the, the different aspects of our record. And also different metrics can be very, very informative and we should interrogate them and use them with care. So finally, bimineralization. So what's ex another extraordinary aspect of the, uh, the Cambrian explosion is that we have the appearance of all these different biominerals, silica, high and low magnesium calcite aragonite and calcium hydroxyapatite, uh, or phosphate for short. And I've just color coded here um, uh, Doug Irwin's figure just to show you that some of these groups really did, so they, these seem to, uh, sorry, that's sort of slipped down. This, this should be moved up a bit. We don't have brachiopods way down here. Um, but these, these groups have multiple different uh, types of mineralogies. So all these mineralogies were, was acqu were acquired as part of the Cambrian explosion. And this is the third hypothesis, which might seem rather uh, unusual, but I, what I want to propose is that ecology increasingly control the distribution of these biominerals. So here's a, at the Great Barrier Reef. Everything you see there is a biomineral. And of course, biominerals are very, very useful. They're used for a, a protective uh, um, car, uh, case, um, crystal case, such as this uh, beautiful diatom here, this silicious diatom. They can provide an internal skeleton for musculature who explore very high energy predatory lifestyles. And of course, biominerals have been co-opted for other reasons apart from uh, anti-predation uh, protection, uh, uh, most exemplified by this beautiful um, trilobite eye where the unique optical properties of calcite uh, have been harnessed. Uh, we can think of skeletons as incurring a cost and this cost is really has two uh, simply two components. One is the availability of precursor ions, and secondly, the energetic requirements. So first of all, the availability of ions. It's no surprise that uh, carbonate skeletons are very, very common today, simply because our tropical oceans are absolutely super saturated with respect to uh, aragonite um, and high magnesium calcite today. But if we go to black smokers, uh, we can see that this really quite ugly but extraordinary gastropod uh, has made its scales out of pyrite and greegite. So in other words, this animal is simply harnessing whatever is locally available, in this case, pyrite and sulfur, and harnessing to produce uh, very, very effective biominerals because they're cheap and they're available. If we consider the energetic requirements, uh, not much work has been done on really understanding the metabolic cost of producing a skeleton. But what we do know in some forms which show a lot of phenotypic variability of size, so this is this beautiful carry shell, 
And this is remarkable for showing a, a huge phenotypic range of size. And what we know is that for a doubling of shell size actually incurs a tripling of cost to the animal because the animal is having to uh, move its skeleton around. And we also know that uh, it, it's very, it, it is costly to produce, it's so costly to buy mineralized uh, skeletons that many forms have chosen to only buy mineralized those parts that matter most. And a sort of a classic example would be a lobster where we know that the claws are preferentially bimineralized much, much less than the, uh, the body cavity, simply because this animal is a lion weight predator and it can't have a heavy, heavy skeleton if it wishes to follow that lifestyle. However, this cost benefit isn't static. We know that the uh, precursor ions in seawater have changed tr tremendously through time. So this is just one example of how the magnesium calcium ratio seawater has changed and it's led to this oscillation of calcite and aragonite seas. Uh, now for a lot of the biota in, uh, in the, the Ediacar and Cambrian, um, even if we don't know exactly what some of these taxa are, we can make a pretty good stab at their, uh, eco their crude ecology and we can at least put them into some of these bins, uh, sessile attached, sessile unattached, motile and then nekton, free swimming and, and often predatory. And we know that the energetic requirements follow the ecology. So as you go up this uh, succession of increasingly more metabolic demanding uh, lifestyles, the, the cost of producing a skeleton increases. And of course, we know that from, uh, we're not exactly sure when, the, the, the origins of biomineralization of, of predation are, are slightly murky. There's some possible drill holes in uh, the late Ediacar, but these are, are somewhat disputed. But we had certainly got crushing uh, predation by the, uh, the um, Series 2, and we know that we have this incredible range of uh, predatory uh, forms by that time. Going back to the oxygen story here, uh, so what we're going to consider now is this record of bimineralization from the end of the Ediacar and right through to the Ordovician. So first of all, just thinking about the changes in seawater chemistry, we know that the beginning, uh, the end of the Ediacar and the beginning of the Cambrian, we had a lot of phosphate and a lot of sulfur dissolved in seawater. If we look at the mineralogy of ooids and lowest, uh, earliest syn sedimentary cements, carbonate cements, we can see that we had early uh, aragonite cements in the Terranuvian. Then we had some a, a transient uh, period of low magnesium calcite cements back to aragonite and then to low magnesium calcite. And this seems to imply that we have some fairly dynamic changes in calcite and, and aragonite seas through the Cambrian to Ordovician. If we look at the mineralogy of all the groups that form skeletons from the, the latest Ediacar and right through to, this, uh, to the to Ordovician, you can see that during the Terranuvian, right up to when the very first inorganic precipitates of low magnesium calcite appear, uh, we have all these different biominerals appearing except low magnesium calcite. Only when the inorganic precipitates change to low magnesium calcite do we see the appearance of biota that have acquired a low magnesium calcite skeleton. Of course, these are very significant groups like uh, um, trilobites. However, what about ecology? So here's exactly the same plot, but just color coded for these, these four crude ecological bins. And if I just toggle between the two, you can see that there really is a correspondence between them. So to interrogate that further, we looked at uh, all the, the, the general we could get our hands on and just plotted up uh, the, the uh, ecology of the groups with a particular biomineral. So first of all, high magnesium calcite. This is remarkably dominated by forms that are sessile and attached. They're basically the reef biota. And these are effectively low cost, simple and massive skeletons. However, and this is very, very different from the, uh, the aragonite uh, distribution. Here, aragonite, aragonitic forms are dominantly motile and also the, the sessile unattached forms here shown in pink. And these are these elaborate composite cataphract skeletons uh, formed by uh, yeah, mobile forms, um, a lot of um, tomotids and the, the small shelly fossils, uh, um, stem group uh, lophotrochozoans, and also some uh, 
of the earliest mollusks uh, with mother of pearl and these cross lamella structures that are with us today. And this is very, very different from the record now of the low magnesium calcite. So remember, this corresponds to the onset of the calcite seas. And we see these novel organic rich composite materials, particularly in arthropods, and they show greater resistance to predatory attack. Of course, the optical properties of calcite are harnessed here for the first time. And it's interesting to think of whether trilobites could have acquired these remarkable eyes of calcite prior to the onset of these calcite seas. And we also see these prismatic foliated mollusk structures. So the record here is really dominated by these benthic motile forms. So in other words, oh, then, and then finally phosphate, very, very different record. We have essentially a record of early sessile attached forms. These are things like the conulares, and then a later record where we have this incredible uh, crescendo and rise of predatory uh, nectar here, the ketognath uh, uh, arthropods and so on. And I think what we're seeing here is simply this uh, early phosphogenic event was utilized by these sessile biota. It was simply cheap to acquire phosphate at that time. But later on, we see the acquisition of calcium hydroxyapatite associated with these biota that have these very predatory, metabolically demanding lifestyles. And we know that if, these, uh, if you have a high energy lifestyle, you produce ATP, ATP will often uh, form lactic acid, and lactic acid will dissolve a skeleton made of calcium carbonate, but it does not dissolve a skeleton made of calcium hydroxyapatite. So in other words, uh, the, although phosphate is thought to be a very costly biomineral to acquire, it seems to be critical for, for and, and, and correlating with the acquisition of this high energy lifestyle. So putting these together, we have a clear linkage between choice of bimineral and ecology. And this is really remarkable because it tells us that there's something uh, going on at the molecular templating stage of, of biminerals. We know that the proteins, proteins are very important in assembling biminerals and, and creating uh, different polymorphs, particularly of calcium carbonate from the amorphous calcium carbonate, uh, whereby um, a lot of biominerals start. But it means that there's some relationship between the extrinsic uh, seawater chemistry and the intrinsic uh, relate with the relationship in, in the uh, the um, manifestation and the workings of these these proteins. And we absolutely have no understanding really of these molecular mechanisms. So putting these together, if we just plot all the biominerals through time here, uh, through the uh, end, end of the Ediacara and through to the early Ordovician, we can see this extraordinary change of succession of different biominerals, starting off with aragonite and high magnesium calcite. Aragonite then wanes, uh, high magnesium calcite becomes important in the in series two, but then we have this incredible rise of low magnesium calcite forms and phosphate forms. And again, if I uh, then plot these by uh, the, the same plot, but of just the ecology, you can see there's an extraordinary coincidence. In other words, what we see here is that biominerals were acquired successively in groups, which were successively more met metabolically demanding. In other words, the, the first biominerals were acquired in sessile and attached forms, but successively in these groups, that must have been responding to something extrinsic in the environment, whereby the increased cost of producing a skeleton was offset by an increased chance of survival. And I think this is a classic example of evolutionary escalation, where we can really evoke the rise of pred predation in all its uh, shapes and forms that was creating this escalation of the acquisition of, um, of biminerals in these successively more demanding metabolisms. So I think uh, we've gone, gone some way to proving this third hypothesis that ecology is really important in, dis, in increasingly controlling the distribution of these biominerals in, the, in our Ediacara and Cambrian uh, fossil record. But the, the underlying molecular processes of how this happened are really quite unknown. So just to conclude, we really are dealing with a, a uniformitarian world here. Um, late Ediacara metazones were restricted to well oxygenated oases, but the redoxycline was extraordinarily dynamic and it remained dynamic 
not only in the Ediacaran, but well into the early Cambrian as well. We see these differential turnovers and quite remarkably um, high resolution changes in body size. And they seem to have been structured by something something is driving them externally in, in, the, in the environment because we see some synchronous changes, possibly dynamic changes in redox and nutrient input, but these remain to be fully tested. However, what's important is that physiology may actually cause the differing response of these drivers and also our choice of metrics and how we, we interrogate this is very, very important. But together, this is really creating this distinctive record of early metazoans in the Cambrian explosion. And in particular, it really does help us uh, predict the form of its demise. There is selectivity at the end of the Sinsk event, selectively removing these typically Cambrian forms. And then finally, we see that skeletons were successively acquired in groups with increasing levels of activity and actually also under tighter biological control. We see the rise of far, far more complex hierarchical skeletons during this time. And I think that we can infer that the increasing cost of, of biomineralization in more demanding metabolisms was simply offset by the increased chance of survival as conferred by a protective skeleton. This was a classic escalation from predation. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much to Rachel for another absolutely amazing talk. Um, my apologies to Rachel for the technical issues um, we had, but we got there in the end. And also apologies to everyone at home this evening. Um, just to say, we'll have a chat with Rachel about whether she's happy to pop the recording online. And if so, um, the recording uh, comes through a different stream. So that will be uh, not affected by the issues that you are experiencing at home tonight. Uh, apologies, but thank you to you all who stuck with us. Um, and just to say, um, we've got a few questions already, but if you have any more, um, do keep them coming in. And I think a nice one to start with, because it was in your um, introduction, um, is from uh, Catherine Tully, who asks, um, how can one read a four-dimensional <laughs> yes, map? Um... It's. Um, I mean, obviously, we, what what we what we've produced are are two D two D maps. But obviously, uh, we well, it's 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 really it's really yeah, that they're two D maps that we that we layer on top of each other. I mean, it's the closest you can get to four D in the in the in the geological record. Um, so in other words, it's it's the, it's x y and z plus time. So, so yes, coming up with graphics to show that is is a little um, tricky, a little challenging. But uh, I, I think we've uh, yeah we've done the best we can. And um, looking at the uh, the Cambrian extinctions that you were you were talking about, Matthew asks: Could the Cambrian extinction be due to a lip volcanism, a large igneous province? A large igneous province in Western Australia is known to date around this time. So, what do you think was driving? Well, I think you have to you have to step back a moment and ask whether there really was a mass extinction. And I think personally, this is a matter of great debate, and it is not yet resolved. Uh, we know that um, the, the, the the real problem we're up against is the problem of correlation. Uh, we have many many fossil strata all over the world, but we have some gaps in the record and not all of them are well dated, particularly close to the boundary. And this leads to some tremendous issues in uh, really finding evidence uh, and proving that uh, when biota leave the record, they, are, they, they leave synchronously. And this is not even, uh, um, this is not even uh, thinking about issues of, of taphonomic windows opening and closing and so forth. So I think the, there is no real consensus yet on whether there was a mass extinction. There may be, there may not be. Um, and of course, lips are the flavor of the month because we know that lips lead to um, hyperthermals and are frequently evoked with other mass extinctions because of course hyperthermals leads to ocean stagnation and the rise of um, you know, sluggish circulation and hence anoxia. So, uh, 
I, I, it is quite, it is possible, and we know, we know that there are, there are dated lips around this time, but I think nobody has really come up with the smoking gun, uh, which is to correlate uh, the lip with, with uh, the ex actual moment of extinction. And I think that, that remains to be done. And, and, and a mechanism, of course, a process, for example, widespread anoxia as the mechanism of, of extinction. So this is this is all um, you know. I know I know many groups working on this currently, but it's, it is not yet proven and not yet resolved. And, and while there is a uh, while we're talking about hot debates in paleontology, we of course have people joining us in the audience from all around the world, um, and we might even have some young budding paleontologists. So that's a little challenge. Maybe you can be the next person to solve what's going on in the Cambrian. And at that point, I'll just put a plug in that we've put a link up for all the non-members in the audience. Or why not join the Paleontological Association today? We've popped a link up. It's not just about uh, annual meetings and, and publications. There are a myriad uh, events that the association puts on, support for young and upcoming paleontologists, grants, and so much, not, not enough time to talk about it all today. So click on the link, learn more about what you can get from the association and have a think about joining the Paleontological Association today. And at that point, we will go to a question um, from Roy Plotnick, who's joining us and asks, is there an independent productivity proxy? Actually, I, um, just before I answer, answer that, I've just noticed that Alex Liu has mentioned the Australian lip being dated the Simsk. Actually, it's dated to after the Simsk. It's the Kandahar. Uh, um, it, this, yes, it's now, there's a, there's a new ash bed date out, and I believe it's now at least one and a half, if not two million years younger than the Simsk. So that's quite interesting that the, the, the if you like, this, this mass extinction was a double whammy, something causing the stink, the, the Simsk, and then this uh, subsequent lip. They're, they're, not, they're not actually synchronous. Um, going back to this, the, the, the productivity, again, this is being worked on uh, very much. Um, there are, there's a, a, a phenomenon called, phosph uh, a technique called phosphor speciation uh, created by uh, Simon Poulton, who also um, co-created the iron speciation technique. And it's very, very interesting because it effectively tells you about the changing bio, uh, bioavailability of phosphorus um, through time. And uh, we've, we have published some work on using phosphor speciation in the NAMA group and uh, that really does tie in this high productivity at the beginning of the NAMA group and then this waning of productivity. We show a difference in the dynamics of um, phosphor speciation. And I think this is going to become a very, very powerful technique because um, oxygenation is certainly important, but like so many things in the world, it's, it's not going to be the only thing. And very often oxygenation often goes, at hand, an oxic pulse often goes hand in hand with, with some sort of productivity pulse. And I think a, a, a combination of an integration of iron and um, uh, iron and phosphor speciation is going to be a very, very powerful way forward. And uh, while we're on the topic of uh, Alex Liu, it, it is appropriate, the principal author on the paper describing the Ediacaran uh, form, Haotia quadriformis, should have um, uh, budded like a Nadarian in our attendees. And there are multiple Alex Lus, only one of which, who knows which one, is actually Alex Liu. <laughs> But one of them has asked the question um, because you because you showed a lovely uh, paleogeographic reconstruction um, back from uh, the Ediacaran and Cambrian looking at. And their question was, um, was Siberia cold in the Ediacaran? What was the uh, climate like for uh, Siberia during the Ediacaran? I'm trying to remember whether we have any any clumped isotope. There's, there's no clumped isotope data. Um, I think the chance. And there's a, there's a little bit of isotope data around to try and uh, it understand. So oxygen isotopes are often used as a proxy for temperature. Um, we definitely had um, slightly uh, more temperate. Um, I think Baltica has been shown to be more temperate. But I think the chances are it, Siberia was pretty tropical, subtropical to tropical. 
I mean, we have all, all the sedimentology indicates that. Um, I mean, where you find ooids, you can be pretty sure that you're dealing with a supersaturated ocean, and uh, and uh, reason and, and probably sl possibly slightly elevated salinity at some points, and um, and tropical temperatures. What one thing that we suspect about the Cambria, but it's not yet proven, is that the latitudinal gradient of carbonate supersaturation may not have been the same as today. It might have been more like the Cretaceous, where you had uh, the carbonate factor extending slightly more into uh, more um, beyond the subtropics compared to today. Because we know that this, you know, the carbonate belt has, has, has waxed and waned through time. But yes, the Siberian platform, we're, we're fairly confident was, was pretty warm. It would have been a very nice place to go swimming. <laughs> Excellent. Um, um, just to say that lots of people on the chat saying thank you very much, Rachel, for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, we've got a question from uh, Matthew who asks, who says, I am aware of some preliminary studies using boron isotopes to suggest oceanic pH changes after the cryogenian glaciations. Is this something that could be applied to the Cambrian? Yes. We, we, it's yes. We we have preliminary data, um, and it's work in progress. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of these these proxies, uh, boron, calcium isotopes, lithium isotopes, they they will help us together to really get at some of these issues of um, of uh, weathering changes. Uh, all these isotopes are proxies for slightly different things. So lithium isotopes are a very good proxy for for weathering and different sources of weathering. Calcium isotopes also have a component of weathering, but others, other people think that they may be actually tracking styles of diagenesis and also styles of dominant mineralogy. Boron isotopes um, have a, also a component of weathering, but also pH. I mean, I was involved with a study using boron isotopes to detect ocean acidification at the Pomo Triassic, where we, we surprisingly found a remarkable spike, negative spike of boron isotopes, which we interpret as, as a, a transient ocean acidification event. And um, my colleague, Simona Karsman, has done a lot of work on using boron isotopes together with lithium and calcium at the end of these snowball earths. And she's shown that they have these synchronous spikes in multiple localities now. Um, so it's definitely telling us something about the, the, the dynamics of the earth system, how it responds to these extraordinary events. Um, so, yes, I think absolutely um, we have a great few years ahead of us uh, as, as a community to, to really try and combine um, metrics of, the, the, as paleobiologists we're interested in, uh, metrics of, of, of all sort of paleobiology, physiology with these increasingly more um, honed geochemical tools. I think it's a, a very exciting time to bring these worlds together. And, and there we go, the, the, the sense of some uh, new discoveries on the way. And if that wasn't reason enough to join the association, maybe you should sign up and come along to Palace Annual Meeting next year, where maybe Rachel and her wonderful group will be presenting some boron isotopes. So do join us. And while we're on the topic of joining, we seem to have spurred a bit of debate and interest in joining in the chat. Just to say you do not have to be based in the UK. You do not have to be a British citizen. The palace is open to absolutely everyone. Um, all the details are on the website. We very much welcome you and the grants are open. Um, so do check out the information. But if you want more information, all the contact details are on our website. Now, I'm going to give the final question tonight to our final speaker tomorrow, which is Hedda, who's going to be uh, zooming in through the Internet all the way from California, um, who asks, was the transition to reduced weathering and nutrient poor waters mentioned earlier global? I.e., could it have been driven? Sorry, I.e., could it have driven the Kotlinian crisis expressed in other basins? So, was the transition to reduce weathering and nutrient poor waters global? Um, I suspect not. I suspect it was regional. 
Um, the I think that we what one thing we know about the terminal Ediacaran, a uh, high header by the way. Um, one, one thing we, we know about it is that the, the distribution of redox was really, really heterogeneous. What we don't know much about is the length scales of these oxic oases. Some places they, they were probably large, some places they were far smaller. We don't know much about the, we know they were dynamic, but we don't again know the time scales over which they came and went. One of the problems is our Although these proxies are fantastic and they've opened up a whole new world, they are still relatively crude in, 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 because they rely on powders. So the problem with both, um, well, the iron speciation proxy is you need to take a powder. You can't interrogate. Um, so, so by taking a powder, you, you are always going to be time averaging. And one thing we know from Namibia is that particularly in these inner ramp areas, uh, we have bedding plains absolutely covered which, with clearly in situ fossils, skeletal fossils, but when we when we interrogate them for iron speciation, we get an anoxic signature. And I'm pretty sure this is simply because this oxygenation was was tra was transient and more short lived than the the powder the, 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 the powder that we can extract, if you like. So this is this is we're we're, we're at the limits now of the of our geochemical toolkit. And I'm sure it's going to improve. Um, I think one way forward is to use other we, we need we, we can use the same proxies, but we have to use different sources of information. So, for example, early marine cements that are clearly attached to fossils um, is, is a good way forward, particularly when we can show they were sin sedimentary. Um, I think Namibia had the, the story in Namibia of this increasing stabilization driven by uh, decreasing continental weathering. I don't think that's necessarily the case anywhere. It's almost certainly not the case, for example, in South China, because we know that South China had was was highly productive and had more extreme anoxia. It didn't just have um, ferruginous waters, but it had an expanded euxinic wedge as well that came and went. So euxinia is a more extreme form, if you like, of anoxia. Um, so, so yes, the the I I think that in ten years' time we're going to have an incredible picture of a very very heterogeneous world, and I think a, a really a really good way forward is to try and understand the, the 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 regional nature of redox and how that is controlling the regional nature of these biotas, which we know are are regional. What an exciting point to, to wrap it up this evening, the exciting work that's still to come in the next few years. And it's also just brilliant to see in the chat, we have people who have signed up and joined the palace tonight. So that, welcome to the Paleontological Association. Um, at that point, I'm gonna thank uh, Rachel once more for an absolutely fascinating talk and brilliant responses to all the questions. And I'm gonna invite Paddy to join us to wrap up the evening. Thank you, Jack. Uh, there's very little I want to add. I mean, I don't know if you saw some of the chat uh, going through, Rachel, at the end of the talk, but it was great talk, fantastic talk, a tour de force, um, which I thought summed it up absolutely. Um, thank you uh, so much for taking the time this evening to give us uh, that insight into what we know and what we don't yet know. and as importantly, how we might go about finding out more about this critical interval of Earth history. And I think um, you're taking the time to do that is very much appreciated by all of us. Jack, thank you for Master of Ceremonies, conducted impeccably, is brilliant. And um, finally, a huge thank you to the audience, not just the Palace delegates, but in particular and especially all those, including the most recent people who've joined the association and anybody else who's um, dropped in this evening to um, learn a little bit more about paleontology. So thank you one and all for your efforts this evening.